So let's take it back. Let's go back from the beginning. So Venice Beach, am I correct in saying? Yeah, I, I was uh, I was born in Hollywood. Lived there for a year. I don't remember that, obviously. And then my parents moved to Santa Monica, which is a neighboring city of Venice, which was nicer. And then a uh, typical story, a divorce. And I moved with my mom to where she can afford. And that was Venice. So that's... Uh, Probably, you know, that that's what me told me everything and gave me the, all, all the information that I push out is all from what I saw in, in this place coming up. Yeah. Um, what what was the influences back then? What were the how did you first what was your first introduction to hip hop and and the culture? Uh, graffiti uh, before that, seeing people dancing, you know, and um ask you know seeing a circle and people dancing at the beach and then uh me being with my mom or, or my father and then they could see how interested i was in this song or enhanced i mean uh, in a trance by it and so but they probably asked some you know for me and then we're going to uh the warehouse or music plus or tower records or these places that were selling you know cassettes and they're buying that song or that album for me with that song on it that I like so much. And then I'm running around the house to imitate that. And so just a lot of imitation. Um, I've said it before. I think I'm lucky when, you know, when, the when beach street came out wild style, you know, crush groove, all that shit, mm. it was all based. We had break in that was based on the West coast. The, all the prominent movies that were the good ones to me were all based on the, the culture of New York and East Coast and hip hop's origin, where it started. Um, I was lucky enough to when I saw those movies, it wasn't like I was, it was totally foreign to me because I was, my neighborhood was lit up with graffiti. There was dudes dancing. They might've been pop locking more than they might've been breaking, but there was still the same thing happening, you know? And so mm. it really wasn't like I lived in a, in a rural suburb somewhere and I had never seen this. I was like, oh yeah, that's what I'm doing at the beach to me and so it, it kind of like reaffirmed what i was seeing with, was dope you know mm. so I, was, I was all the way in but for a long time i wasn't trying to participate in the culture i was maybe i was through graffiti um but i was skateboarding i was doing all the shit that that comes with venice beach you know and then when i moved next door to qd3 who was quincy jones son who was a prominent rap producer at the time crazy you know, yeah so, yeah one of the greats and so I, then i got invited into his garage like i'm sitting in now which i basically copied and um in a house in venice right like my whole shit is qd3 <laughs> basically and, uh, <laughs> and 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 i saw how rap was getting made and not only that i saw rappers who i had heard of and seen and mm. some of them really big ones coming through so it was everlast and got to see ice cube in the driveway next to my house what the fuck you know what i'm saying and Madness. shit like this yeah like what the fuck and because of that all my friends knew, and so they want to come over. So maybe we're there we could go smoke, drink, listen to do graffiti, listen to fucking dope rappers, producers. It was like a twelve year old's. What the fuck? You know what I mean? So that brought Alchemist over. That brought Will I Am over. That brought Red Foo over. That brought DJ Am. All these people coming through because QD three next door to me. Yeah, that's a that's a probably dream. really didn't like me that much. To be honest, man, nobody really liked me. <laughs> why? <laughs> Explain just, why. You go to Ev's house, then you go to the QD three house. <laughs> nobody had a rap studio at that time. There was no that was unheard of, you know. Uh, but this was a golden era of hip hop that you know was literally just passing, passing through the doors, and that must just have ugh, it must have just blown your mind with what was potentially possible from within those within those four walls yeah and then i took some beats i got from him and ran around the city like i got beats from qd3 and that's how i met raka yo let's do i got qd3 beats let's do it and that led to dilated and so yeah i i owe uh q a nice dinner <laughs> not, not not fake nice like benny is like real nice like something really <laughs> yeah you know the proper stuff <laughs> the, the, the stuff that some royalties are made yeah, of yeah. um the dilated people era of your career, which is where I think internationally most um, most people will recognize your voice, the name, the, the 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 principles of what dilated was to a lot of people was a bit of a roll call. It was a 
it was a war cry. It was a war cry from a from a b boy perspective. Do you know what I mean? No, elaborate. Well, because the way that it came across um, the overseas and landed, you know, it was it was of the raucous records era, um, and I'm talking more about you know. I'm talking more about the 12 inch EPs and the, 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 just that transfer of the backpacker era. For sure. We had a, we had a good role in that part, you know, dropping work to angles and third degree and triple optics and main event and all that, those yeah. 12 inches and mini EPs rang out so hard. We ended up getting a record deal through it, you know? So it, it was, it was an early lesson about independence. And I, unfortunately I strayed away from it as we got to deal with capital, you know, but, I'm grateful because it was still the root of what I did. The, the the fundamentals of that never left us. And so when I returned to that off of a major label and went back to starting evidence independently, I had already been there before. And so it wasn't, it, I'm grateful for that. Yeah. Cause you'd already walked, the, you've already run the course. Yeah. Yeah. What was the, what was the deal with um, removing yourself somewhat from the, the major label situation? You mentioned that. What, what, what was the, thought behind that we didn't remove ourselves actually um we're we're kind of um an anomaly in the sense that we were on capital records yeah which really wasn't a rap label when we went there they had beastie boys about it mm-hmm. and um we went there for that reason we had choices we could have gone to interscope or other places that had offered us that were more seasoned in rap right. but we liked the openness of capital and, and the money was better so we went there but um we finished our fucking contract with them, four albums. And the fifth album was slated to be a live album or a best of album. Gotcha. So we, yeah, we finished our contract. It was like literally like crazy. That's mad. Not a lot of people do that. So there was no calling for to like go find another label and continue that by the time it was done, saw where we fit into this game and live in a pipe dream to try to continue that. It wasn't going the direction of us at that time. Yeah, you hear those stories. Oh, actually, sometimes you you witness it, don't you? You see acts and bands play out in a certain way. We were just like, yeah, man, like that doesn't feel natural, <laughs> you know? Yeah, not everybody is meant for a fucking big label. Yeah. Um, and, with, and with that said, I would tell everybody to try to sign to a big label. A lot of people say, well, you know, you're smart and you've learned this independence and, and there's way more money to be made over in the independent for what you're doing and there's a lot of truth to that. There really is. But how would you really know if you might work well in a major system? You might make a hit fucking record. You might it might bring you all everything you ever dreamed about. So if it didn't pan out. It worked well. We made a career. I'm, I own a house. I'm, things worked out well. But the the it wasn't the best fit for us. For other people, it might be the best fit. So I would say if you're young. Go for that shit. Find out. You know what I mean? You've got to go through the experience. You've got to have the... You've got to cut your chops and learn that stuff, right? Super yes. important. Why Why? Why not find out? Yeah. So moving on from there, you know, getting into... Getting into the more um, independent stuff once again and your own individual um, music. If it's certainly this is certainly where the 360 of evidence kind of kicked in you know this is where it felt like you had you had harnessed all the lessons that you'd learned up in 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 these kind of early stages and with the first album with dilated being on the major this kind of this kind of formed your for me personally when i when i even listen back to it now it's like yo this is so much more well refined it's almost like you had the the idea was being tweaked all throughout the uh, throughout the journey. The craziest part about Dilated Peoples is the best songs on every album to me were our solo songs. We always had one or two each where I wouldn't be on Rocket's song and he wouldn't be on mine. And those really, or I wouldn't say they're the best. They had the most identity. Mm. Because Rocket could really, he didn't have, Rocket wants to speak on wild shit. He's very educated, smart. He wants to warn people on certain shit, other shit he wants to subliminally throw at you. He's very calculated and, and a great writer with a great rhythm. So, and a great voice. Rock is amazing. So the the when he got to just do him by himself, I think he shined. And when I got to be myself, I think I finally, I was coming through as this is who I am. And so I think going solo 
was the smart thing, you know, doing solo records, not going solo, but doing solo records was a way for us to finally establish who we were as individuals, not just with the hair and the one who jumps in the crowd and the, and the cool DJ. You know? I mean? Yeah, I got I, I got to I got to go with you on that one because there was a lot that was going on. What you know, big up Rucker, big up um, Babu, because and Babu had had his thing going on with Beat Junkies, and then. Rucker had his thing going on, you know, and it was, for me, it had this kind of like Wu-Tang-esque formation. Do you know what I mean? Where you could go about doing individual projects. You know, this was almost like the launch pad, right? Yeah, that's platform. That's what I called it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The pl- sorry, sometimes for everybody watching, there's a little latency sometimes. So if we talk over each other, it's, I love you. Yeah. Um, yeah, there is, isn't it? <laughs> on the on the pla- on the platform, there's a uh, you know on the liner notes it says "Look out for our solo albums coming soon." And that's 2000, right? Yeah. So my solo didn't happen until 2007. Yeah, that's right. And man, yeah. <laughs>